Hi, I'm Keith Williams, and I'm an American Studies and Anthropology student at UC Davis. For this video whiteboard, I want to give you a brief introduction to Dr. Nick Gee's piece, The Labor of Fun, How Video Games Blur the Boundaries of Work and Play, and Dr. Curtis Moretz's piece called Cesar Chavez, The United Farm Workers, and the History of Star Wars. Once upon a time, the jobs and responsibilities that people had were easily segmented from their playtime. To work, it usually meant that you had to be in segmented indoor and outdoor spaces to utilize static work tools like the typewriter, the shovel, and the telephone to complete work-related tasks. In reverse, to play, you had to be in separated indoor and outdoor spaces like parks and bowling alleys to socialize and to play with others in leisure. Yes, and if you're thinking that, this is true today. But before digital virtual worlds exploded, these rarely combined to be one and the same. Before the modern digitized world that we live in today, real physical effort and time was required to do one or the other. Now, in the 21st century, through the convergence of digital processes, the merging of work and play has become much easier. And an example of this in action is through virtual reality spaces like MMORPGs. MMORPG stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Game. It's massively multiplayer because many people from most places in the world have the ability to play together. Online because it's played in a virtual space. And these are role-playing games because the object of these games are for players to make up characters and personas separate from their real selves. Dr. Yi, in his piece, speaks about how virtual environments like MMORPGs have made the worlds of work and play very similar. One is now just like the other. Gaming has been made to look just like work in the MMORPG space, for example, because of the great amount of time and commitment it takes to develop an existence, reputation, material independence, and agency to progress in those games. As he wrote in his piece, you should spend on average 20 hours a week in online games, and many of them describe their gameplay as an obligation, tedium, and more like a second job than entertainment. Using well-known behavior conditioning principles, video games are inherently work platforms that train us to become better game workers. Later in the text, he mentions why this is through the video game Star Wars Galaxies. Pharmaceutical manufacturing is one of many possible career choices in the game Star Wars Galaxies. Some other career choices include bioengineering, architecture, fashion design, and cooking. Pharmaceutical manufacturers create their products by combining raw resources. These raw resources, such as chemicals or minerals, must be located using geological surveying tools and harvested using installations brought from other players skilled in industrial architecture. Resource gathering is a time-consuming process that involves traveling and constant maintenance. Just like the real world, to be a successful MMORPG player, you need to learn a skill to make a living, be social to sell that skill, and build a reputation. Usually, just like the real world, that takes a lot of time. However, within those worlds of fantasy and the real world producers who make them, the usual human elements of morality, justice, and common good can get lost in a hybrid reality of gaming and work. For example, Dr. Curtis Merez in his work speaks of this dehumanization in terms of how producers in Silicon Valley have lived in a fantasy bubble universe where their decisions and actions don't account for the poor and disenfranchised worker. For most of his piece, Dr. Merez theorizes that California is morphing from 1960s countercultural individualism to modern neoliberalism through the success and failure of the United Farm Workers Union, corporate agribusiness, the narrative of Star Wars, and the trajectory of its creator, George Lucas. As California moved into later years, Dr. Merez positions that Silicon Valley has solidified this same sort of neoliberalism by saying, Before the rise of the high-tech industry there, the region was largely known as an agricultural area with significant population of migrant farm workers and low-wage cannery workers. And so, like Lucas's corporate empire, Silicon Valley originated out of an agribusiness culture and economy. And according to Manuel Castells, Silicon Valley companies developed a new work model, 
limited to their more privileged employees that drew upon elements of 1960s countercultures but melded them to capitalist entrepreneurship in ways that recall Lucas's own historical morphing. Although Dr. Yi documents the normative constraints of many gamers, Dr. Moretz in his piece through Silicon Valley and Star Wars feels that producers who created those constraints failed to account for the social difficulties of those who played their games in real life. Finally, the artifact. I chose the video web series Feminist Frequency, created and hosted by feminist media critic Anita Sarkeesian after a successful Kickstarter campaign to raise funds to produce a series of videos examining the various tropes that are used to depict women in video games. In her famous Tropes vs. Women in Video Games series, Ms. Sarkeesian gives her audience case study examples of video game play where women are utilized as sexist and marginalized props. In many cases of those digital experiences, a player must work through realistic scenarios to complete their missions. Unfortunately, some of those tasks involve the dehumanization of women. Although her critics say that she cherry picks extreme examples to prove her points, she simply is asking video game makers and the players who love those games, why is sexism a necessary choice in those gaming experiences? Ms. Sarkeesian, through her work on feminist frequency, is a prime example how egalitarian digital fantasies can marginalize the other.